Welcome back to another Precon Upgrade and Deck Tech. I'm Daniel. Thanks for being with us today. We are looking at the most wanted Precon. And the reason it's the most wanted is because it's Olivia, the most wanted in all of Thunder Junction. She's the big bad. We're looking at Olivia Opulent Outlaw. She is one red, white, black for a vampire assassin. She is a 3-3 with flying and lifelink. It says whenever one or more outlaws you control deal combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. And outlaws is a new category of creatures which includes assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks. So any creatures that have that as their subtype count as outlaws. And then you can pay three, sacrifice two treasures, and put two plus one plus one counters on each creature you control, activate only as a sorcery. So she's going to help us generate treasure tokens, and then we can sack those and buff our whole board to make them gigantic and swing in for lethal damage. So now that we've looked at the big bad, let's look at the other new cards printed specifically for this pre-con. First up, we have our secondary commander. It is Vihan Gold Waker. He costs red, white, black for a dwarf warlock, and he is also a 3-3, and says other outlaws you control have vigilance and haste. So he's going to grant that same group of sub-creature types assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks, all vigilance and haste. And then at the beginning of combat on your turn, you may have treasures you control become 3-3 construct assassin artifact creatures in addition to their other types until the end of turn. So potentially with him working in tandem with Olivia, you could take the treasures you have, turn them into 3-3 construct assassins until the end of turn, swing in with them, and then sacrifice to add the two plus one plus one counters onto the actual treasures, and then keep buffing them turn after turn, turning them into bigger and bigger creatures as well. Which is super interesting and definitely a unique spin on using treasures, although we do see other decks that animate other artifacts as well. So not completely new, but definitely kind of unique. But the biggest thing that he does is give your outlaws vigilance and haste. Next we have Angelic Sellsword. This is four and a white for an angel mercenary with flying and vigilance and says whenever angelic cell sword or another non-token creature enters a battlefield under your control, create a 1-1 one, one red mercenary creature token with tap target creature you control gets plus one plus O until the end of turn, activate only as a sorcery. And then whenever angelic cell sword attacks, if its power is six or greater, draw a card. So our commander can obviously buff this up by sacking those treasure tokens and then we can put two plus one plus one counters on angelic cell sword she also makes the one one token creatures there are several there are several new cards in this set that specifically make the red mercenary creature token that taps to add plus one to a target creature next we have back in town it is x2 and a black for a sorcery that says return x target outlaw cards from your graveyard to the battlefield so some recursion here for this deck specifically and targets those outlaw creatures so it could you know if you had a pirates deck or a rogues deck this could potentially be useful in that as well next we have bounty board it is an artifact for three and it taps for any one color of mana and then you can pay one and tap it and put a bounty counter on target creature whenever a creature with a bounty counter on it dies each of its controller's opponents draws a card and gains two life so this is a good incentive for your opponents to want to attack each other and all of that person's opponents, including yourself, will draw a card when the creatures with bounty counters on them die. So that could potentially be good in a goad deck as well. Next we have Charred Grave Robber. It is two and a black for a skeleton mercenary. It is a three one and it says whenever it enters the battlefield, return a target outlaw card from your graveyard to your hand. And then you can escape it for three black black and exile four other cards from your graveyard. So that is how you can recast it. And then Charred Robber escapes with a plus one, plus one counter on it. So it'll come back as a four, two if you pay the escape cost. Next, we have Dead Before Sunrise. It is three and a red for an instant that reads until end of turn. Outlaw creatures you control get plus one, plus zero and gain tap. This creature deals damage equal to its power to a target creature. So it's a way to make your creatures be able to fight other creatures. 
Next, we have Discreet Retreat for three and a black for an enchantment aura, and you enchant a land, and it says enchanted land has tap add two mana of any one color. Spend this mana only to cast outlaw spells or activate abilities from outlaw sources. Again, that's that group of creature subtypes. Whenever you cast your first outlaw spell each turn, you draw a card and lose a life. Next, we have Greywater's Fixer. It is two black and a red for a lizard mercenary who is a 4-4, four, four, and it says each outlaw creature card in your graveyard has Encore X, where X is its mana cost. And Encore says exile it and pay its Encore cost. For each opponent, create a token copy that attacks that opponent this turn if able. They gain haste, sacrifice them at the beginning of the next end step, and activate only as a sorcery. And then lastly, we have another enchantment, which is We Ride at Dawn for two and a white. It says legendary creature spells you cast have Convoke. And Convoke means your creatures can help with the casting costs. You tap them, and then each creature you tap can pay for one mana of that creature's color or just one generic mana. And then it reads, whenever your commander attacks, create a 1-1 red mercenary creature token. So it gives your commander that same line of text that we were talking about earlier to make those 1-1 mercenary creature tokens. All right, next we are going to take a look at all of the reprints in this deck. That'll be the whole rest of the 99. But before we do that, please take a second and drop a like down below. And if you like our content, please consider subscribing. It helps us so, so much. Also, if you're not interested in seeing the rest of the 99 and you just want to get to the budget upgrade and removal, we will drop that in the chapters down in the description below. So just go down where it says ads and removal, click on that and it'll jump you straight ahead into the video where we just go over the budget additions and then what cards we take out. So first, let's take a look at the game plan for this deck. It is a plus one, plus one counters deck at heart with a sort of sub theme of treasures and being able to use those treasures to add the counters to our team to be able to go wide and swing out in for big damage against our opponents. So let's first look at how we're going to do that. So we have got eight ramp spells. Those are going to include mana rocks and things of that nature. Then we're going to have 15 card draw spells, which is fantastic. Need as many abilities to draw cards as possible. Then we're going to have 10 interaction spells that is going to be spot removal and things of that nature. And then we've got one board wipe, which is a little bit low, but because we want to go wide and grow our board, we probably don't want to board wipe ourselves as often as we can avoid it. And then we've got 37 lands, which is a little bit high in my opinion, but in a pre-con, that's still pretty good. So I will say that eight ramp is a little bit low. That being said, we do have a total of 35 outlaws in this deck. So 35 cards that play into the strengths of what our commander wants to do. And when we attack, each of those are going to be creating treasure tokens. Now, as you know, treasure tokens can be sacrificed for mana. So even though we don't have a ton of ramp, our commander gives the rest of our creatures the ability to make treasure tokens at every combat. So we're going to lean a little more heavily into that in our upgrades. But that is the reason why the ramp is so low. Usually, I would want to have quite a bit more ramp than that. So with that, let's go ahead and look at the rest of the creatures that are in this deck. We'll start there with Academy Manufacturer. And Academy Manufacturer is a really good card in that it is three colorless for a 1-3 assembly worker artifact creature. And it says if you would make a clue, a food, or a treasure token, instead create one of each. So now every time we go to make those treasure tokens, we're going to be making clues and food. So that gives us access to drawing more cards and gaining life, both which are fantastic in this. And it gets our artifact count up. Then we have Aetherborn Marauder for three and a black. It has flying and lifelink, and when it enters the battlefield, move any number of plus one, plus one counters from other permanents you control onto Aetherborn Marauder. So you can make this thing gigantic whenever it comes in. And then if you have out Vihan, it will have Vigilance and Haste. Then we have Angrath's Marauders for five red red for a human pirate, it's a four, four and it is a damage doubler. Anytime a source you control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals double that damage instead to that permanent or player. So double on combat damage, double on non-combat damage. That is awesome. Then we have Brina the Demagogue. It is a bird warlock for one white black for a one three with flying. It says whenever a player attacks one or more of your opponents, if that opponent has more life than another one of your opponents, that attacking player draws a card and you put 
two plus one plus one counters on a creature you control. So more incentive for your opponents to attack each other, and then you get the benefit of the counters. Then we have Captain Lannery Storm. It is two and a red for a human pirate. That's a two, two, and it has haste. And it says whenever it attacks, create a colorless treasure artifact token. And then whenever you sacrifice a treasure, Captain Lannery Storm gets plus one plus until the end of turn. So if you use Olivia's ability and you sack three tokens to put the plus, plus one plus one counters on your creatures, you would also buff up Captain Lannery three times. Then we have Captivating Crew. It is three and a red for a four, three human pirate and you can pay three and a red into it and gain control of target creature and opponent controls until the end of turn. Untap that creature, it gains haste until the end of turn. Activate this ability only anytime you could cast a sorcery. Then we have Changeling Outcast. It is one black for a shapeshifter changeling, so it will also fall into our outlaw category. And it says Changeling Outcast can't block and cannot be blocked. So you could potentially buff this up with those counters and make it huge and unblockable. Then we have Dire Fleet Daredevil for one and a red. It is a human pirate with first strike. And it says when it enters a battlefield, exile target instant or sorcery card from an opponent's graveyard. You may cast that card this turn and you may spend mana as though or mana of any type to cast that spell. That if it would be put into a graveyard this turn, exile it instead. Then we've got Dire Fleet Ravager for three black black for an orc pirate wizard with menace and death touch. It's a four four. When it enters the battlefield, each player loses a third of his or her life rounded up. So that's a banger. Then we have Fane the Broker for two and a black. It's a legendary creature human warlock and it's got a whole bunch of tap abilities. Sack a creature, put two plus one plus one counters, remove a counter from a creature you control to make a treasure token, and then sacrifice an artifact to create a two one white and black inkling token with flying, and then you can pay three and a black to untap Fane the Broker. So if you've got lots of mana sitting around, you can untap him and keep doing these things repeatedly. Then we have Grenzo Havoc Razor. It is red red for a goblin rogue. It's a 2-2 two -two and says whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, choose one. Go target creature or exile the top card of that player's library until the end of turn. You can cast it and spend mana of any color to do so. Then we have Humble Defector. It is one and a red for a 2-1 and you can tap it to draw two cards. Target opponent gains control of Humble Defector. Activate this ability only during your turn. So you tap it to draw two cards and then you give it to somebody. Then we have Impulsive Pilferer. It's one red and it says when it dies, create a treasure token. And then you can encore it for three and a red. Then we have Camber the Plunderer for three and a black. It's a vampire rogue and it partners with Loreen the Diversion. It has lifelink and it says whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, you gain one life and make a blood token. Then we have Laureen the Diversion, and she partners obviously with Camber, as we just saw. She has First Strike, and pay two, sacrifice an artifact or creature, go target creature. So we will be making lots of artifacts, and so you can potentially use that to goad some other creatures. Then we have Mari the Killing Quill for one black black. Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, exile it with a hit counter on it. Assassins, mercenaries, and rogues you control have death touch, and whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, you may remove a hit counter from a card that that player owns in exile. If you do, draw a card and create two treasure tokens. Then we have Marshland Bloodcaster for four and a black. For a vampire warlock with flying, you can pay one and a black, tap it. Rather than pay mana cost of the next spell you cast this turn, you can pay life equal to that spell's mana value. So just a way to utilize our life total as a resource. And then we have Massacre Girl for three black black. It's a human assassin for a four four and has menace. And when it enters the battlefield, each other creature gets minus one, minus one until the end of turn. Whenever a creature dies this way, each creature other than Massacre Girl gets minus one, minus one until the end of turn. So it exponentially grows and turns into a board wipe, provided that there are enough creatures out. Then we have Mirror Entity, another shapeshifter with Changeling, so it's going to be every creature type. And then you can pay X into it, and until the end of turn, creatures you control have base power and toughness, XX, and gain all creature types. In this deck with all those plus one plus one counters, this could be really huge because you could take some one ones and two twos and pay a whole lot into Mirror Entity. They are going to become, you know, five, five, six, sixes. And if you've already buffed them with those plus one plus one counters from your commander and other sources, they'll be massive. Then we have Misfortune Teller for three and a black. A human warlock with death touch when it enters a battlefield or deals combat damage to a player, exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a creature card, make a 2-2 two -two black rogue creature token. If it was a land card, 
create a treasure token. So another way to make more treasures or to just populate our board with two two tokens. Then we have Mist Meadow Skulk for one and a white. It's a Kithkin Rogue. It has lifelink, protection from converted mana cost three or greater. Then we have Morbid Opportunist for two and a black. It is a human rogue. Whenever one or more creatures die, draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn, but potentially you'd be drawing on your opponent's turns as well as their creatures also die. Then we have Nighthawk Scavenger for one black black. It has flying, death touch, and lifelink. It's a vampire rogue, and its power is equal to one plus the number of card types among cards in your opponent's graveyards. Then we have Ogre Slumlord, three black black for an ogre rogue. It's a three three. When another non-token creature dies, you may create a one one black rat creature token and then rats you control have death touch. Then we have Queen Marchesa for one red white lack for a legendary human assassin with death touch and haste. When she enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. At the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent is the monarch, create a one one black assassin creature token with death touch and haste. Next we have Rankle, Master of Pranks. It's a fairy rogue for two black black. It has flying and haste, and whenever it deals combat damage to a player, choose any number, and there are three options at the bottom. Each player discards a card, each player loses one life and draws a card, or each player sacrifices a creature. And then we have Tenured Inkcaster for four and a black, a vampire warlock. When it enters the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on a target creature. Whenever a creature you control with a plus one plus one counter on it attacks, each opponent loses one life, and you gain one life. Vain Witch Coven for two and a black is a vampire warlock with menace. Whenever you gain life, you can pay a black. If you do, return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So a nice little bit of recursion there. And finally, we have Witch of the Moors for three black black for a human warlock with death touch. It is a four four and at the beginning of your end step, if you gained life this turn, each opponent sacrifices a creature and you return up to one target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So that rounds out our creatures. So next, let's move on to the sorceries in this deck. And first up, we have Council's Judgment. It is one white white, and it says Will of the Council. Starting with you, each player votes for a non-land permanent you don't control. Exile each permanent with the most votes or tied for the most votes. So it's a good way for the table to get rid of something that's bothering you. Then we have Feed the Swarm. It's a sorcery. Destroy target creature or enchantment, and you lose life equal to that permanent converted mana cost. Then we're going to have Hex for four black black. It says destroy six target creatures. So that can take care of a lot of things. And then we have Mass Mutiny for three red red. And it says for each opponent, gain up to one target creature that player controls until the end of turn. Untap those creatures. They gain haste until the end of turn. Then we have Painful Truths. It says converge. You draw X cards and you lose X life where X is the number of colors of mana spent to cast this spell. Requisition Raid is one white. This is a new card from the set and it is a spree. These are new cards where you can cast them for their original cast cost, but then the spree kicks in. And for this one, you can pay an extra colorless. So at this point, one and a white to destroy target artifact. You could pay two and a white, destroy target enchantment, or you could pay three and a white and put a plus one plus one counter on each creature target player controls. And at that point, you would be doing all three. It just gives you a little versatility and it gives you a little bit of variety to choose how you want to play this card. If you have the mana to sink into it, you know, you will do all three modes, but you know, you can cast it for the first one if that's what you need it to be. So having that sort of selection is very nice. And lastly, we have Seize the Spotlight for two and a red. Each opponent chooses fame or fortune. For each player who chooses fame, gain control of a creature that player controls until the end of turn. Untap those creatures and then gain haste until the end of turn. For each player who chooses fortune, you draw a card and create a treasure token. Moving on to our instance, we have Boros Charm for red white, and it says choose one. Boros Charm deals four damage to target player or permanents you control are indestructible until the end of this turn, or target creature gains double strike until the end of turn. Then we have Curtain's Call for five and a black. It has Undaunted though, and it says this spell costs one generic less to cast for each opponent and destroy two target creatures. Then we have Deadly Dispute for one and a black. And in addition to cast this spell, sacrifice an artifact or creature. Draw two cards and create a treasure token. Then we have Heliod's Intervention. It is X white white, and you can choose one, destroy X target artifacts and or enchantments, or target player gains twice X life. Lastly, in our instance, we have Shoot the Sheriff, and it is one and a black, destroy target non-outlaw creature. Then we'll move on to our artifacts, and we've got Arcane Signet. 
We have got Bandit's Hall. It is three colorless. Whenever you commit a crime, put a loot counter on Bandit's Hall. This ability triggers only one each turn. This is also a new card. It is not exclusive to this pre-con. It is from the main set. And committing a crime is targeting opponents, anything they control, and or cards in their graveyard. And then you can tap this for a mana of any color. And then you can pay two into it, tap it, remove two loot counters from Bandit's Hall to draw a card. So quite a bit of versatility there. Then we have Glittering Stockpile for two and a red. And it is an artifact treasure. And you can tap it and pay a red, put a stash counter on Glittering Stockpile. And then you can tap it, sacrifice Glittering Stockpile, and add X mana of any one color where X is the number of stash counters on Glittering Stockpile. Then we have Idol of Oblivion for two. You can tap it and draw a card. Activate this ability only if you created a token this turn. Then we've got a good reprint here with Lightning Greaves. Equipped Creature has Haste and Shroud. We have Orzhov Signet. It filters your colorless mana for you and makes white or black. Then we have Rakdos Signet, which does the same thing except for black or red. Then we have Soul Ring and Trailblazer's Boots. Equipped Creature has non-basic Landwalk with an equip cost of two. Next, we have our enchantments. There are five of them. Two of them were the new cards, so we've only got three left to go over. We have got life insurance for three white black, and you can extort. Whenever you cast a spell, you may pay white or black. If you do, each opponent loses one life, and you gain that much life. And then it says, whenever a non-token creature dies, you lose one life and make a treasure token. Then we've got Reign of Riches for three red red. When it enters a battlefield, make two treasure tokens. The first spell you cast each turn that mana from a treasure was spent to cast has Cascade. Next we have Shiny Impetus for two and a red. It's an enchantment aura. It says enchant creature and enchanted creature gets plus two plus two and is goaded. So it must attack each combat if able. And whenever enchanted creature attacks, you create a treasure token. And then we have got 37 lands. Notably, we have got a great reprint here with Command Beacon. That is probably the most valuable reprint in this deck at $13. And then we have several lands that tap for multicolors and several utility lands as well, including Bajuka Bog, Demolition Field, Desolate Mire, Rogue's Passage, Sun Home Fortress of the Legion, and Vault of the Archangel. Next, it's time for everybody's favorite part, our ads and subtractions for our budget upgrade but quickly before we get into that smash that like button for me guys it really helps us out a ton and that way we know you're enjoying the content plus your hands already on your phone i know it's there just smash it okay this deck makes a ton of artifacts and creature tokens so in an ideal world the first ad we would have would be a doubler however because of the clues and the foods and all of the tokens that have been coming out lately, Anointed Procession and Mondrak have skyrocketed in price, nearly doubling for Mondrak. Um, he went from about 20 bucks to about $40 right now. So that would blow our entire $50 budget. So we're not going to include one of those cards. However, if you have one, definitely put it in here. So first up, we've got Lotho Corrupt Sheriff. It is white black for a legendary halfling rogue. And it says whenever a player cast their second spell each turn you lose one life and create a treasure token then we have malik grim manipulator a human rogue and it is two red white black for a four three and it says when malik grim manipulator enters a battlefield you and target opponent each secretly choose a creature that player controls then those choices are revealed and that player sacrifices those creatures whenever an opponent sacrifices a creature you create a treasure token then we have Pitiless Plunderer for three and a black. It says whenever another creature you control dies, create a treasure token. Then we have Port Razor for three red red for an orc pirate. And it says whenever Port Razor deals combat damage to a player, untap each creature you control. After this combat phase, there's an additional combat phase. Port Razor can't attack a player. It has already attacked this turn. So potential game ender for you. And then we have Reckless Fire Weaver for one and a red. And it says, whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, Reckless Fire Weaver deals one damage to each opponent. This card can do some serious work in this deck. Then we've added one of the better board wipes. It is Blasphemous Axe, so when those other players' boards are getting out of control, you can cast it for a single red. Then we've got some better removal than what came in the pre-con. And since we're in white, we added Swords to Plowshares and Path to Exile. And then lastly, we added Monologue Tax. It is two and a white. And it says, when an opponent casts their second spell each turn, create a treasure token then we have rage reflection for four red red and it says creatures you control have double strike so now your creatures will be making 
two treasures per attack phase because it says because your commander says when a creature you control deals combat damage to a player so as long as those creatures are dealing combat damage to a player you're going to get double and then lastly we went big and swung for the fences with smothering tithe for three and a white it says when an opponent draws a card that player may pay two if the player doesn't you create a treasure token so we've upgraded how many treasures we're going to be able to make therefore allowing us to pump our board even bigger because we'll have an excessive amount of treasures and we came in under budget at 46 dollars and one cent so just below our 50 dollar allocated budget okay so the cards we are getting rid of are going to be Hex, Curtain's Call, Marshland, Bloodcaster, Camber the Plunderer, Laureen the Diversion, Glittering Stockpile, Painful Truths, Captivating Crew, Humble Defector, and Two Basic Lands. So that rounds out our deck tech and review of this pre-con. Thank you guys so much for stopping by. Please check out our other social medias down in the link below. Like and subscribe. Check us out on Patreon. We do lots of giveaways and box breaks at super cheap rates if you're interested in opening new product we just overhauled that and jump into our discord as well we do stream live games on twitch so if you're interested in streaming live games with us you can hop over into twitter at southern sorcery and send us a message that you want our sign up sheet we'll shoot that over to you thank you guys so much again have an awesome and great day bye